we're always being told that if exercise was medicine, it would make someone a fortune. So when I saw a title of a session that says exercise is medicine, then I was very intrigued. And I welcome now uh, Michael Roden, who was the chair of that session. Michael, tell me a bit more about the session and is exercise medicine? So that's a very good question. Um, we have learned that lifestyle modification is very important uh, to improve diabetes and obesity, also with regard to the so-called hard endpoints, which is cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Um, we had three topics during this uh, session addressing mechanisms, uh, factors that could modulate response to exercise, then the role of exercise in people with type 1 diabetes. These are the diabetic people that need insulin um, for throughout their life um, and they depend on insulin. It's very important how they can have exercise within their life. And then number three was the role of responders and non-responders to exercise. So not everybody uh, reacts to, to uh, exercise the same way. So the first uh, talk was uh, summarizing new modulators uh, of uh, exercise which uh, might come from the skeletal muscle and uh, modify metabolism in other tissues su such as the liver or the adipose tissue. And on the other hand, factors that come from other tissues and have metabolic effects in the skeletal muscle during or after exercise. So there are so-called microRNAs, uh, which is a, a number of different um, RNAs that are released from different tissues and can be increased or decreased during exercise. They might be transported in the circulation uh, directly or uh, packed into so-called exosomes, which are particles which might serve as shuttles uh, for different factors between the different organs. And they, uh, they are beginning to be more and more important in understanding the effects of exercise. And other factors are proteins and cytokines, which are released upon exercise. And better understanding of these factors might help us to find new treatments which simu simulate the action of these factors or blocking the, the bad guys might actually also help to improve the response to exercise. Um, exercise, a pill instead of exercise. More or less. <laughs> yes. Let's turn now to the type 1 diabetics because most type 1 diabetics, of course, uh, are diagnosed in uh, early life yeah. and exercise, many people want it to be part of their life. Yeah. So what do we learn from that session? So the, the, the problem of exercise in type 1 diabetes is that exercise definitely decreases the blood glucose, the blood sugar levels, and uh, type 1 diabetics are relying on insulin. So you need, and insulin decreases blood glucose also. So you need to match the exercise to the dosing of insulin and also to the intake of carbohydrates in order to keep the blood glucose constant and to prevent hypoglycemia. And, and we have heard during this talk that uh, different kinds of exercise might actually be uh, more convenient for people with type 1 diabetes not to fall into low blood glucose levels. So uh, if you combine exercise, for example, with fructose, uh, which is uh, uh, another form of the usual sugar, that might help to keep the blood glucose more stable in people with type 1 diabetes. And some kinds of exercise would also help to have more stable storage of sugar as glycogen, which is the storage form of glucose in, in, in the skeletal muscle. And that was addressed. And on the other hand, it's not only the different types of exercise and diet, it's also the tight control of blood glucose. And there's uh, new devices which allow us to more or less continuously measure blood glucose levels, uh, which is very important for people with type 1 diabetes to balance their exercise and their dietary intake in order to keep blood glucose stable. And what people are nowadays using, actually since quite a while, but also now in type 1 diabetics, is uh, NMR spectroscopy, which is a non-invasive technology to directly measure 
glucose or glycogen or other metabolites in the skeletal muscle, which allows you to have a direct in vivo information on the metabolic state. And knowing this during experiments might help you to better understand the metabolism uh, in the skeletal muscle of people with type 1 diabetes exercising. And on a practical note, I guess it's, it's a very helpful thing to know for people who are type 1 diabetics, the type of exercise that of best suits them and what they need to do yep. in order to sustain that yep. exercise. Um, let's turn now to the third part uh, of the session, uh, which I was really intrigued by, this idea that some people are responders to exercise and some are non-responders so we we have made the uh, uh, we have made the experience that um, more or less depending on the type of exercise up to 40 or even more percent of the people exercising do not adequately respond what what does response mean so response can mean improvement of insulin sensitivity which is important for people with diabetes so that more glucose is taken up by the skeletal muscle and other tissues to improve metabolism but it can also mean uh, a better per cardiovascular performance reducing risk factors of cardiovascular disease such as lipids so it depends on the endpoint what is a response to exercise or it could simply be that you know with all those endorphins rushing around they just feel great after they exactly. exercised exactly. and that's an important exactly. point of course in diabetes but in 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 general terms uh, what response or non-response to exercise means is that under comparable conditions of exercising, you get a metabolic response. So let's say improvement of insulin sensitivity. And it turns out that there is some kind of a genetic influence. Uh, we nowadays know, I would say, a handful of genes or so-called single nucleotide polymorphisms, so minor changes in genes, which actually regulate this response to exercise. And these, these relate to the function of the adipose tissue. They also relate to the function of the mitochondria, which is more or less the power plants of, of the skeletal muscle. So if you have well-functioning uh, mitochondria, then you are able to burn more fat in the skeletal muscle and you have more energy to perform exercise. So it makes sense that uh, genetic variation in these genes has substantial metabolic effects. And there are also other uh, genes that have been reported. The important observation, however, is also that it really depends on the volume and the intensity of exercise. So once you uh, have people considered to be non-responders and you increase the volume and the intensity and the duration of the exercise intervention, turns out the substantial number of these people ends up as being responders. So it really depends on the kind of exercise, the motivation of uh, the people, if you are a responder or a non-responder. Nevertheless, under normal, regular conditions, we, we need to balance the amount of exercise to what is feasible for the people. So there will still be some kind of non-responders, and for those it might be really uh, helpful to know uh, what their usual response is. So that makes it easier for some people to have a specific form of exercise which is not useful for all other people. So on my iPad here, I have the results of genome sequencing that I had done recently uh, in uh, relation to a program. Um, there's no escape for BBC journalists anywhere. Uh, but my genome sequencing told me that actually I would lose more fat through high intensity exercise okay. than I would through endurance exercise from looking at particular SNPs. Yeah. So I think that that. that it goes further along, doesn't it, in this idea that we've seen a lot in this uh, ESD Congress of personalization, Absolutely. of perhaps thinking really a workup at the beginning of diabetes, which group do they fall into, what, what are they like phenotypically, what are they like genotypically? I think that um, this Congress has shown that um, exercise and, and how exercise is modulating metabolism is really a part of this precision medicine concept, that you can really find stratified ways for different groups of people to have the best out of any kind of uh, intervention. And as you mentioned, high-intensity exercise training really turns out to be a feasible way 
uh, also for type in a safe way for type 2 diabetic patients to improve their metabolism and to get more fit uh, and reduce their cardiovascular risk. And it's rather popular because you only do it for a short amount of time. Yeah. No hours in gym kit. This is only about literally a couple of uh, 20 minutes or so. But really fascinating. Thank you so much for coming along to talk to us about it. Because I think that this has lots of practical implications for practicing uh, diabetologists. It was a pleasure. Thank you Thank very much. Thank you very much. And you can see that session in full on easd.org.